here I am, back again, and I have spent some time living with this ocean song for a little while, and looking at the sheet music, the composition style of it, I did a little bit of reading about the, the background of it, what I could find, and now I want to share with you what I think about the piece and what I have enjoyed about it after these days. Water has served as a source of inspiration for composers for ages. Fountains, lakes, rivers, streams, springs, the sea, rising mist, rain. It offers endless musical opportunities and this piece fits right in with the rest. There are several interesting things to notice about it, so let's dive right in. First of all, Unlike a lot of the music I've listened to so far, this piece I would certainly not call a song. Wait, what? It's true. For something to qualify as a song, definition-wise, it has to have words, lyrics. Well, okay, in classical music we do have some things like Mendelssohn's Songs Without Words, written for piano solo, but even with those, Nobody would ever call them simply songs. Anyway, back to Butler's Ocean. If it's not a song, what do we call it? I really don't know what the customs are among rock music lovers and rock music definitions. All I can say is what I know, which is that in the classical world, we have a couple terms we use fairly generally You've heard me use them along the way by accident because they're just part of my vocabulary. Peace and work. Not like the idiomatic phrase, a piece of work, but more along the lines of implying a piece of art or a work of art. But what if we want to be more specific? Well, then we start classifying these various works according to their form or context. So again, drawing from my classical background, we have things like symphonies, suites, concertos, oratorios, sonatas, and dozens of others. And I began thinking, if I were trying to describe this ocean piece to a fellow music lover who's familiar with these various artistic forms, how would I choose to do it? And it wasn't a very hard question to answer, actually. I'd use the term fantasia, or the anglicized form fantasy, which describes a piece of music, usually for instrumental solo, like this guitar piece, that is free form, meaning it doesn't follow any specific architectural design as you would find in a sonata or concerto and is in an improvisatory style, often with a bit of showy technical qualities thrown in. Which is actually kind of cool, because while the term does have a long history, it really started to become used in the 16th century by lutenists who were kind of the first to use it widely. A lute, by the way, is a kind of plucked string instrument which has some similarities to the guitar, but with a lot more strings and a funny bend in the neck. These lute fantasias were both fantasies in the modern sense, meaning improvisatory in character, and in the words older meaning of fantastic, which meant full of extravagant d display and that's, that's the way they used it. Here's a link to one of those pieces in case you want to get a feel for what they were like back then. And now here we are listening to a modern guitar piece, which is free form, improvisatory, and displaying the performer's technical and musical prowess. It feels a bit like we've come full circle. Another question which came up has to do with the tuning of the instrument. I understand this piece employs a non-standard tuning for the guitar, and I was asked if this is done on other stringed instruments as well. And my answer is yes. In fact, we even have a special term for it. 
scordatura. Probably any stringed instrument gets tuned in a non-standard way from time to time. For example, in Bieber's Rosary Sonatas for Violin from back in the 1600s, most of the sonatas in that collection require non-standard tuning, and one of them even requires a couple of the strings to be crossed over each other down at the tailpiece. And Bieber is not the only one. Vivaldi, Haydn, Paganini, Saint-Saëns, and of course, as we move into the 20th century, tunings get even more experimental. Or if we're looking at plucked string instruments like the guitar, we could also look at the harp. Well, the harp has had some unique tuning challenges for as long as it has existed. Because unlike guitar, lute, or the bowed strings such as violin or cello, every string only creates one note. We can't press our fingers down on a fretboard or um, fingerboard to get a whole series of notes out of one single string. So retuning on a harp was such a basic part of playing the instrument, we don't even bother to call it scordatura. It's just a given if you play the harp. Every time you look at a new piece of music, you look to see what tuning your instrument needs to have. Now, a lot of these challenges were resolved or at least diminished when we got the double action back in 1811. But still, we harpists end up retuning some strings differently than normal on occasion. Now, let's look at some of what makes Ocean work so well, because it does work well as a piece of music. First of all, it might seem like with such a long and varied piece, there must be a whole lot of musical construction material used in order to fill up all that time. But actually, what we have is a really great example of improvising on a small little bit, building all kinds of things out of a little handful of notes and chords. And the variety and length comes from how he takes that musical material and manipulates it, letting it shine in various ways, sometimes creating an ethereal textural effect, other times giving it more of a rhythmic handling, and other times letting it run around and explore as he exploits the little corners and contours of the musical material. For example, listen to these few notes and you'll recognize them as belonging to the music, but you might not be able to place exactly where they come from. And that's because they are found in nearly every part of the music. Let me show you. those three notes. Maybe if I were to play them a little bit more expensively, you might recognize it a little more easily. So let's say I'm going to do it, oh, we could go like this. that wasn't exactly what the music did, but it suddenly started to sound more familiar. Sometimes these notes are hidden in the strummed chords, sometimes you hear them at the bottom of the rippling textural arpeggios, sometimes the order in which they are played is modified, and when the music is dancing and spinning and, and his fingers are running all up and down the notes, you still hear them woven into the musical tapestry. By the way, if you want to support my journey on this channel and at the same time learn more about music theory and composition techniques, even if you're a total beginner, check out my membership community where I am currently presenting a music theory course which is designed to take total beginners all the way to the point that they can write and arrange their own music as well as understand all music better and even unlock some of the classical music world. Now, I guess one of the things that I find delightful about this piece is the very recognizable way 
he is weaving the music together. I listened to a few different performances of it these last few days, and I also read some of the comments on those performances. And I noticed that listeners are often amazed at how he almost never plays it exactly the same. That is classic improvisation on display. If you know your musical material, such as that little handful of notes that this piece is built around, you don't need to repeat note for note in a piece of this style. You can simply go with the flow, let the kaleidoscope shift as you play, and it comes out marvelously eternally alive because of that very thing. Now, of course, this is a very guitar-specific composition. He has made it to be so thoroughly idiomatic to the instrument that it's practically impossible to play on anything but the guitar. In fact, it even has to be electric guitar to work properly. Nothing else will do. No other instrument can produce what he plays here. And I love that too. It's a sign of someone really knowing the instrument and writing in a way that exploits its capabilities to the fullest. It kind of helps to elevate the instrument's musical worth. It gives it a place of its own that no other instrument could fill. But we can still talk about some of the techniques he employs to expand and develop the music. One of the pl places I've mentioned is the rippling, delicate textured arpeggiated parts. Little fun fact on the side, the word arpeggio actually means like a harp. So how does he create this mood, this feel in the music? What he does is take a simple chord like this, which is E major, and then he spreads it out. Maybe instead of having all the notes here, he'll take, let's say this note here, and he'll move it up the instrument a ways, maybe, maybe placing it here. Oh, let's put it here. All right, so now we have this note and this note and this note, all the same as the first three, just shift it around a little bit. And then he simply plays them rapidly in what we might call a broken style or arpeggiated style, something like this. I can do all kinds of things with that pattern. Without even moving the notes any further, I can play bottom to top. Or I could start in the middle. Or I could go ascending and then descending. So you see that there are dozens of different ways to handle every little part of the piece. And he simply takes a chord here and uses that pattern as the basis for a whole portion of the music. You can even modify it a bit. Let's say we move it up here and then I have, I start using two E's, this E and this E, back and forth. You see how easy it is to create this wonderful atmospheric feeling with just a simple little pattern like that, if you place it well on the instrument. This is a common musical technique and probably appears in all musical genres and styles, at least that I can think of. In this particular piece, the way it's used reminded me of several different types of music. Spanish classical guitar music and impressionist music especially, as you heard me mention in the first listen. We can think of impressionist music as being the sonic equivalent of impressionist paintings. It immerses us in an aural experience that clearly evokes a mood or an image or an environment. And just as scenes featuring water were a common feature of the Impressionist painters, so also with the composers. It's fluid, ever-changing, hard to nail down, contains motion, sets a mood, and even produces its own music when it moves. It's very 
It's a very attractive subject matter for a musician to try to capture its essence. It's not only the musical textures like arpeggios that I mentioned just now and showed you a bit, which we use to evoke such an image, but also the choice of harmonies. We don't want them too chiseled, too directed, so we choose chords that don't settle, don't line up in, in a channel too quickly. There's a piece for harp, which is a great example of this, by a French harpist named Marcel Tournier. I want to show you a little bit of it because the ocean piece that I'm talking about is not suited for the harp, and I cannot demo exactly what happens on the harp in the ocean piece. But I can show you something similar in this piece. But before I tell you the name of it, I want to play the opening. And I want you to simply close your eyes and see what kind of image the music evokes all on its own as I play it. Does it place you in a certain world, a certain space, and bring up images of fresh, clear, flowing water, perhaps with cool, damp air, not much sunshine? The title of the piece translates, as close as I can get to literal, something like, by the spring in the forest. Now going back again to the ocean piece. It's a bit more sunny, clear, and cheerful because it's set in a major key that keeps us in the happy, positive zone. But it, too, uses some chords which are not totally settled or clearly defined. Let me show you what I mean. Let's start with the E major chord. Now let's listen to this chord here. It's not so bright. It has a little bit more of a... of a dissonance to it. Like it's not perfectly settled. And then the next chord which comes is even a little bit further. If I rearrange those notes, we simply have... And those kinds of chords are wonderful for evoking a watery world. If you put a few of those back to back, pretty soon we have a sense of motion that is not strongly directed or channeled. The current can shift as it pleases and then present those harmonies in varied textures, arpeggios, strummed chords, running lines, and before long we're off on a journey through a magical watery world. Let me show you just a little bit more of what's happening in this piece of music. Let's take these same chords that I just showed you, and now we're going to format them as close to what we have in the Oceans piece as I can on the harp. And already we have this sense of fluidity, of motion. It doesn't yet tell us that we're in the ocean, but the things that he does throughout the piece to develop the textures and, and moods a bit more carry us a bit further into that ocean 
territory. And as you might remember, um, if you watched my first listen, you remember I said, to me, it felt like I was underwater, maybe scuba diving or something, in a clear tropical sea where th the light is bright. And that is because of the major E here, around which this entire piece is built. But at the same time, he inserts enough of these other watery type um, unsettled chords that we aren't just sitting on the beach with the sun blazing down upon us. We are truly immersed in the wateriness of it. I'm going to also include some links to water-inspired music in the description below in case you are thirsty for more. So do I like this piece? Yes, I do. It is nice. It's not the kind of piece that I would sit down and listen to for hours on end intentionally, like focused listening, but it could very easily show up on my playlist from time to time because it is the sort of music I might put on in the background to set a nice relaxing mood, which also allows for conversation and interaction. In closing, I want to remind you of the poll going on in the community tab, which was opened a few days ago. Five new artists who have anniversaries or other special dates next month and if you haven't yet, please go there and vote for your favorite band and remember to drop a comment with your song of choice. Also, if you want to receive notifications when I post new content, click the little bell next to the subscribe button. And if you haven't seen my first listen of Ocean, click this link. It will take you there and you will get to enjoy with me my first experience hearing it. I'll see you soon.